Hello and welcome to the Crochet Circle podcast. I'm Faye and this is my monthly crochet podcast with a little bit of knitting on the side. You can catch the audio version of the podcast on Acast, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Stitcher, Spotify and lots of other podcast platforms. The video version is available on YouTube. Each podcast has full linked show notes which can be found at www thecrochetcircle.podbean.com and you can also follow me on Instagram crochet underscore circle underscore podcast Welcome to the Crochet Clan and our amazing community Hello and welcome to episode 56 of the Crochet Circle podcast This one is called Social Network and yeah I'll explain why as we go on into um, into the podcast but hello I'm waving, how are you all doing? I hope you are doing uh, really well into the summer in the UK, although it's belting it down out there. I've had to run to the house repeatedly, so I'm ever so slightly damp um, because well, basically I couldn't get my act together for this podcast. Um, not that I didn't want to record it, but some podcasts I'm like really on it, everything's organised, it's very regimented. And I've got everything ready to go and I press record and that's it. Today I think I've been in and out of the house about 50 times. It's been ridiculous. I've just had to go back out because I forgot to bring my cotton in that I've been using. It's been one of those weeks where it's just like two steps forward, five steps back. Two steps forward, five steps back. If you've seen on Instagram, I've only shown you two of the projects that I've had to frog this week. Um, <laughs> there have been many. Almost everything I've touched, I have had to frog because it's just, um, nothing's just gone as smoothly. Not in a really bad way, it's just not been smooth. It's just like tentative steps and then having to pull back. So I'm hoping that if I record the podcast, that will be it. I can just park that nonsense and actually just crack on with getting some stuff done. So... I am, it's Thursday morning, I'm a little bit late, but for good reason, and again, I'll tell you why when we come to the social network bit of it. Um, So I've got a job on my hands today to get this all edited down, to get it ready, to deliver to you in less than 24 hours. So I'm going to be burning the midnight oil, and I wouldn't have it any other way, I love it. Right. Shall we crack on and I will give you some old dog new tricks? I have a couple of old dog new tricks for you this month. First one is actual genius and I can't lay total claim to it because I remember Alison from the Keep Calm and Carry Yarn um, podcast talking about this years ago, like years and years ago. And... um, one of the things that she does is she speeds people up on YouTube. So um, I'd forgotten about it. And then there's a podcaster that I really love her content. She's a knitting podcaster. I really love her content, but she just speaks so slowly. And I end up sitting there thinking, come on, speed up, get a rocket up your backside, come on. And... Um, so I discovered that if you go onto YouTube and if you hover down at the bottom of the actual video file, you'll see the settings cog. If you press onto that, then there's um, a drop down and I think second from the bottom is playback speed. And if you click on that, you can speed it up to um, an extra 25%. So you can go to 1.25. When I did that for this knitting podcast, I was like, oh, she's speaking at a normal level. This is amazing. So not only does that mean that I can now like consume her content without feeling like my life is wasting away, um, it means I can listen to and watch more podcasts because I've sped her up. So I've created more time in my day. And then I got to thinking, yes, I have a very soft Scottish accent, but I'm also aware that that mixed with the fact that I talk quite quickly might not be everybody's cup of tea. So the other thing that you can do is you can slow people down. So if you think that I am talking 19 to the dozen, 
you can slow me down by the same means. You could take me down to 0.75 and that might be exactly what you need to hear me and understand me. I'm way more inclined to speed people up and crack on through more podcasts and consume more content. That's how I like to live. But if you've got an issue listening to somebody um, and watch, and it doesn't really affect um, what they're showing you, it just speeds it up a bit. <laughs> I tried uh, Claudia, Crochet Luna on 1.25. <laughs> Claudia, it was hilarious. Your hands were like this. It was really funny. And I had to slow you back down. You're just at the perfect rate for me. But <laughs> you were very funny sped up. <laughs> I dread to think what I would be like sped up. I think I would probably sound like Mickey Mouse. <laughs> On acid. <laughs> oh, so yeah, give that a try. If you struggle with certain podcasters, like I say, no qualms if that's me, if I talk too quickly for you. But if you struggle... On YouTube specifically, you can actually slow people um, up and down. You Sorry, you can slow people down, you can speed them up. Um, so yeah, old dog new tricks number one. Slurp of tea. Old dog new tricks number two relates to a garment that I am wearing. So... I don't know about others of you. I know when I put this up on Instagram, somebody else came back to me and said, yes, I have the same issue. I had assumed it was because of the size of my bust. Um, and she was saying that it's not, that she, um, she's not as big busted as I am and she has the exact same issue. So what I quite often find is when I've crocheted up a garment, if the garment is done almost like a flat piece so with very little shaping, you can end up with these massive gaping holes at the bottom of the armholes and at the top of your chest. I'm going to pop a photo in to show you what this top looked like before I made those changes. Now this is not a slant on this pattern at all because I actually changed it so I haven't done the sleeves around that the top was meant to have. So I can't comment what it would be like on everybody else. I can only... I'm just talking to what happens with me with crochet tops when I don't put sleeves on them and I just get this huge um, gape that comes out, like I say, at the top of my chest. Um, and what I would say is I think that can probably be counteracted if you're working on a top this summer by adding some decreases in when you've split for the arms. So if you've been either working in a panel on the sides, start doing some decreases and bring it up at the point at which you're moving on to the armholes. Um, and that, I think, would actually reduce the bulk that you've got and therefore the gaping. If, however, you don't know that it's going to gape until you've sewn it all up and you've tried it on, that's what happened with me, then um, there's something that you can do about it kind of post-production. So I'm going to pop some photos up so you can see what it is that I've done. All of this information will be in the show notes as well. But basically, if you start down, um, let's say, a few stitches from the middle of your armhole, you're going to be working back and forth in rows. And if you do um, like a, a DC2 together, UK terminology, and then that gets you to your middle stitch, and another DC2 together and a DC and a slip stitch, turn your work, DC and then you could just keep on repeating that but then you would do three or four DC two togethers. It's really going to depend on how quickly you need to pull that in and what I would say is one of the reasons I was able to make that adjustment was because I had left myself quite a large armhole I overheat easily and I hate having um, like lots of bulk and lots of material up at my armpits. It just, it's not pleasant. And so I'd left myself lots of space and I actually had enough space to make these adjustments. Basically, you can keep on going with that pattern and either increase by an extra two DC2 togethers or one and then ending off with a DC and a slip stitch turning and keep on doing that pattern. And what you'll actually do is build up a triangle across your work. 
that will take up some of your armhole space and all it's doing is it's pulling in that gape where it would have been. And I'll be able to show you the difference um in the in the photos. Like it was quite a pronounced gape. I wasn't I wasn't happy with the way that the top had finished because of that. Now interestingly I wasn't getting that same gape at the back of my um armhole, which is why I was thinking maybe it was bust related. Um so I, d I don't know. But if you need a quick fix, let's say you've got summer tops that you've already made and it gapes and you're just really unhappy with it, then doing that DC2 together into the already formed armhole definitely reduces down that gape. I think the other thing that I could probably do is on the back, add a load of chains so I'm keeping the two pieces pulled in together, which will also help me to stop, keep on trying to keep it on my shoulders. Because I haven't added the sleeves on, it kind of naturally wants to fall down a little bit more. So if I've got that chain at the back, my feeling is that that's going to keep the top down when I move and keep the sleeves on the back and that will give a better form as well. So that's another thing to look at before. Maybe you don't have um, much armhole space, so you might not be able to do loads of um, decreases in the armhole space then try adding a chain onto the back piece if you can, if that's if you've got a similar structure top to the one that I've got. So the front of mine is a v-neck, a reasonably deep v-neck. It's not particularly boobalicious, but it could be if I wanted it to be. And the back is um, quite a bit lower. Um, and so therefore I can do that chain across. But if you've got a preformed back that comes almost up to your neck, then you shouldn't be having that same slippage anyway. So yeah, that's the other thing that I'm going to do to make this top even more wearable. So you can see it's still gaping a little bit, but I stopped the decreases because I felt like the material was starting to come too far up to my armholes, which is um, why I want to add the chain on the back as well. So I love it, it's very wearable. But I'll talk more about the top in finished objects. So, Finished objects, let's talk about the top that I'm wearing. Um, this is called the Zigzag Zoomer Top. It is by um, Sandra, who is Nomad Stitches. Hi, Sandra. And um, it's a really lovely quick top. So I had, had I even started this last month? I think I might have done like a round and that was it. It was at the very beginning stages. And I probably finished this off about a week and a half ago. So I've had it ready for the podcast for quite some time. I haven't worn it because I like to bring things to you kind of fresh and let you see how how they are. Um, so I haven't got any like, loads of photos of this yet, partly because life has just been so full on, it's not been possible. So I will get some nice photos and um, I'll place them somewhere. I'll let you know where it's not going to be Ravelry. Um, but the top is, as I said, a lowish v-neck at the front, a deeper v-neck at the back, almost um, straight-sided up the side of my um, arms and shoulders. And then it's got this feely crochet zigzag chevron pattern that goes all the way around the back and the front. And um, it was very easy to adapt to make it longer, so I added more pattern repeats for the chevron because I think the way that Sandra has it um, is a slightly more cropped version. <laughs> I am not the body shape for like a crop top. And um, I just wanted something that would sit a little bit further on my hips and, and you really fit into my wardrobe. And uh, what else did I do? I didn't put the sleeves on, so it should have um, a few rows of uh, trebles, I think it was, going round for the sleeves. I didn't fancy that. I, I'm quite wide-shouldered, so what I don't need to do is add kind of bulk in, to that part of my body. I just It's not a good look for me. So, hence, I just went for two rows of double crochet instead. And I also added a row of double crochet down at the bottom just to finish it off because otherwise in the pattern it's just the chain and 
I felt like it just needed an extra little something. Not just for stability, but also it just, it actually did just finish the top off for me. And what that means is that I have got, it matches now. So I've got double crochet around the armholes, double crochet around the neckline, and double crochet at the bottom. So for me, that's pulled it all in as a, as a consistent piece for me to wear. The linen that I used was pure linen, so 100% pure linen, and it was from uh, Rowan. It is a kind of a dark olive green colour, and I really like it. Linen can be really tough to work with. Um, it's quite hard on your hands. It can be quite splitty. It can be quite fibrous. So it's not really one that's for the faint-hearted, hearted, especially in the one that I was using. It's almost quite a raw linen. Some linens have been very well treated and they've got a blend with them so you can get a cotton and linen blend. Much nicer to work with, much more stable and more consistent. If you're going with a raw form of linen then it's likely to feel harsher in your hand and like I say be more fibrous, it's more likely to get caught on your hook. However, it's worth the effort because it will just soften and soften and soften the more you wear it. The more you wash it, it just gets softer with age. It's a really good hard wearing fibre that you would have in your wardrobe for years and years and years to come. Um, it's like, it's tough. It's almost unbreakable. It's definitely something that you need a pair of scissors when you're moving from one end, um, from one ball to the other. It can't be spit spliced. Um, and you just can't pull it apart really. But I, I thoroughly recommend it. I don't think Rowan are doing this yarn anymore. I bought this years ago, like literally years ago, um, in a massive John Lewis sale when I got loads of stuff for a pound a ball. And so I have used uh, five balls in this. So the top is dead on 250 grams, which means that it cost me a whole five pounds to get the yarn for the top and with the pattern so it was under ten pounds to make this top that makes me so happy i love a bargain <laughs> um i can't recommend the top enough i know lots of you have already been out and bought it um it's really quick to make really quick to adapt to your body shape it's also size inclusive so it goes up to i think just beyond a 60 inch bust so 5xl great lightweight summer top I can see me getting a lot of wear out of this top and it goes with a lot of my wardrobe as well love it so that's FO number one finished object number two I've been thinking about making one of these for literally years and then I started making one and suddenly everybody was making them on Instagram and I'm wondering if it's because there's been this whole rock painting thing going on in the UK during the lockdown where communities were painting rocks and adding them and making snakes and animals and stuff as a point of community interest when people were out on their walks. And now I've suddenly seen, I think, um, Ali, Little Drops of Wonderful, did one. <laughs> but uh, there seem to be crocheted rocks all over the place now. I, I love it that there's like a hive mind setting in there and lots of people... Um, kind of in individually come up with the same kind of group of things that they want to do so I've been like I say I've been wanting to do this for a long long time and I um, had some really nice cotton lace yarn that I wanted to use for it it's specifically billed as a crochet lace sorry as a crochet yarn the one that I was using is by Rico and it's the essentials cotton and it is mercerized and 280 meters for 50 grams. And um, I've got it in two other colors as well. You can see them on the show notes and on the front page of the, the episode banner for this month. As, um, I've showed off the different colors that I have. So I really like the idea of having lots of these stones in different sizes um, ready for use. The reason I wanted to do one is that during the summer months I'm often found outside under our um, umbrella. We've got a seating area out there and if I'm designing or working from a pattern or I've got lots of paperwork 
then that's where I tend to be, but it can still be quite breezy. So I wanted a stone that looked pretty, that was, um, you know, helped with my creativity, that I could keep um, patterns weighted down with. Um, I also want a series of these because when I'm cutting out sewing patterns and I've got the pattern on the material, you need pattern weights. And I thought it would be really lovely to have stones that have been crocheted over for those pattern weights because um, the crochet on the back means that I won't have as much drag on the pattern when I'm shifting the pattern weights around. But also it means that when the pattern weights aren't in use, they can still be somewhere in the house and look decorative and pretty. It's not something that I have to put away in a drawer and hide because I've got something really pretty and I know, I know a stone is pretty in itself but literally I have got piles of stones all over the house and I thought it was time to have a pile of stones that were covered in crochet. So I will be making more of these. I really like the pattern that, um, that I used and it's um, it's got like an almost double tier drop formation going right the way down the centre of it. And then a series of double crochets, again, um, UK terminology, to give it some more solid outline and then more patterning around there with um, a little bit of almost like feely crochet to give it a more open space. What I would say is if you're going to have a go at crocheting around a stone, it's probably easier to start the pattern and rather than think that's the stone I'm going to put it on, start the pattern and then I find a stone to fit because um, the pattern that I was using didn't have gauge. It did give you an idea of the stone size and shape that you should be using but I, the stone that I had that should have fitted it didn't and then I just walked around the house until I found another one that would fit. So probably useful to not think I will do that on that stone but to just have a series of stones that you can then fit it around because ultimately what you have to do is get the stone into it and then crochet around it which is quite fiddly so if you've got issues with your hands I don't believe this is going to be the project for you it is really fiddly to have to hold the weight of a stone and crochet around it to close it up um, I mean, I wanted to close mine up as much as possible because of the um, idea of using them as pattern weights on my sewing pattern. Probably could have got away with um, finishing a good few rounds earlier. But again, the table that I use outside has got a glass top, so I wanted some form of cushioning so that I wouldn't just put a stone onto the glass top. The pattern that I used was actually from Making Magazine, which is, it was issue four called lines and they're so pretty like how could you not want to make them they're really pretty looking they've used a series of just neutral colors there's an ecru and a cream and it's on a linen black ground and it just is really lovely if you've never seen making by the way as a magazine it comes out twice a year i think we're coming up to issue eight this is my favourite multi-crafting magazine by some stretch. So where there was Liner magazine, which was purely knitting, there's also Making Stories, which is pretty much purely knitting. Um, making actually does knitting, crochet, sewing, um, all sorts of different crafts. It's really beautiful. They do recipes in there. There's just a bit of everything. There's weaving. And the instructions are amazing um, for the different bits. Whereas I've had other magazines, like the high-end magazines in the past, where you can kind of get caught up in the momentum of them and think, oh, I've got to have that, I've got to have that, because it's a big deal. But actually, you, when I look through them, there are very few of the patterns that I would actually make very different from making you can see I have actually put one two three there are four tabs in there of the things that I want to make just out of this one issue so if you haven't come across this before like I say this is issue four lines and I think they're coming up to issue eight and um, it's a really lovely publication 
and actually one that I think I'm going to start selling in the shop because because it's so multi crafty. I like that a lot. I mean who doesn't want a little mini basket that looks like a cat with cat ears? I can't say no to that. It's really beautiful. So that is it for finished objects. So in en route, I only have one thing to show you and I only started it yesterday because I felt bad that I had nothing to show you in en route. But I do now. So for a little while now, I've noticed that some of the cushions in our living room are just getting a bit battered. I've got two that are silk and silk always wears. I mean, I think I've had these for... I had these before I moved in with Matthew. We've been married 10 years next week. We've been married 10 years next week. Do you know what? I'm just going to take a moment to celebrate that and the strength of our relationship and how pleased I am to have found myself a Matthew. And uh, 10 years is something to celebrate these days. I'm really... We kind of look at each other and we go, how has it been 10 years? It was yesterday. And then in the next breath, we're like, it feels like it's been 50. <laughs> um, so I had these cushions before Matthew and I moved in together, which places them at almost 12 years old, if not more. Um, and they're they're finally like, the, the silk is wearing through in the corners where you would expect it to. I think there might be like white wine on them. I don't know, maybe that's ice cream, I don't know. But they're done anyway and they needed replacing and I don't I don't want to go to the shops and just buy more stuff. So the cushion um pillows that we have are feather and it's really easy to then just get something to fit around that and to make it myself. So if I'm making a cushion like that, what I tend to do is take the cushion cover off and use that as my size template. So I can just quickly chain, especially if it's a, an easily repeatable pattern, I can just chain a little beyond where I think it needs to be because the chain will always pull in. And then I can just start crocheting away row after row until I've got to the, um, the length that I need. And so that is what I've done here. Now, all I'm going to do with this old silk cushion cover is I'm going to wash it it will get ironed and then what I'll do is cut away the piping and keep as large pieces as I can of the um, the silk itself and this will get reused in something else. There's actually a really beautiful cushion cover in that making magazine that I've shown with little um, tabs of material flipped in different ways. It's stunning and it might be that this parts of this get reused or it might be that I use it as a patchwork for the back of the cushion. Either way, this is not going to waste. I will just chop it down into usable bits after it's had a wash and I've got the ice cream and the wine off it. So, what I did last night was quickly worked up a panel. Um, I'm using a mustard coloured wool. <laughs> which is Big Wool from Rowan. Again, this is deep, deep stash. I'm trying really hard to work through some of my deep stash. And whilst I was looking for this last night, I found another jumper's quantity of wool that I'd completely forgotten about. So, yeah, I, I need to just keep on plugging away with this and using what I've got. Um, it's very much my mentality at the moment. I love new shiny things and they're beautiful, but actually... I've had this for four years maybe and it's time that it got used. So um, Big Wool is exactly as it sounds. It's a chunky wool by Rowan. Again, I think they might still do this one though the colours have probably changed. And again, this came from my John Lewis haul so they were a pound a ball. So by the time I have finished this cushion cover each one will have probably cost me about four pounds to make. I can't buy a, a cushion cover for four pounds. Actually, do you know what sad fact? I probably can, but I don't want to because that's to somebody else's demise. 
Um, if you can buy a cushion cover for four pounds, somebody's paid for it somewhere along the way. The pattern that I'm using uses a bobble stitch and it comes from this amazing newish book called Modern Crochet and it's by De Bros. This is an American book. I struggled to get it in the UK for a good few months and I finally got it and I've got it in the shop. Um, it's not a particularly cheap book. I've got it on at £22.75. What I would say is if you are new to crochet and you want modern crochet, you don't want the older style of crochet, you don't want unicorn puke for crochet. If you want really classic, really paired back neutrals, really paired back stitches that will teach you the basics in crochet without having to go through that... You know that learning phase in crochet that you get where you just get attracted by all the things and then you get six months down your journey and you think, why did I buy that? I don't like that. I'm not impressed with what I made. This, I think, can, this book can shortcut that journey as a beginner crocheter and mean that the things that you make are really classic and from day one you will have pieces in your home and um, things that you want to wear that you will actually want to wear when you come out of that initial crochet journey. It's a hardback book. Everything is in creams and neutrals. There's a little bit of black in there and it is stunning. Like, I have long been looking for a really good crochet startup book that doesn't go jump straight to a granny square. This is it. This is what has been created and I love it. And what I particularly love is it doesn't matter if you're a beginner crochet or you're, you know, a good way through your journey like I am. There is something in this book for you if you like really paired back stuff. If you don't and you're more a fan of um, like the granny square and the really bright colours, then yes, this could be adapted for really bright colours, but you're not going to get a granny square in here. Um, she concentrates on really simple stitches being repeated. So the cushion that I'm making is called the um, Belladere Bobble Pillow. And it makes use of bobble stitches and it builds up in a sort of a honeycomb pattern, which I thought was very suitable for the mustardy yellow, very kind of honeycomb inspired um cushion panel that I wanted to create and it's very textured it's very um tactile what's the word I'm looking for I was thinking feely what's the word for feely what's another word for feely tactile it's a very tactile piece because it's bobble stitches they kind of pop out so you've got a lot of relief on the um on the fabric that you're creating what I would say is it is yarn hungry. This took up 200 grams, so two of those big balls of big wool, but totally worth it because this is going to make such a lovely squishy cushion cover. Um, the panel on the back I won't use the same design for because I want that to be flat so that when it sits against my sofa, it's not sitting proud on the back and there's no need to use up all that wool on the side of a cushion cover that's not going to be seen. So um, I need to work out what wool I'm going to use on the back of it. Ideally it would be the same colour but I don't have more of it and I don't want to buy more of it so I'm going to have to find something in my stash. It might be that I double up... Um, yeah, I might double up some other yarn that I've already got to get a better thickness to match off with this. Or it might be that I just use an increased number of stitches um, on the back and do it with a, a flatter fabric. We'll see. So I'll be working away on this, but literally that was last night and I had to frog it. <sighs> Story of my week. Um, and then still managed to get it finished off last night. So really love it. And I know Gillian is making one as well and a beautiful cream. Um, Gillian's doing it in a, um, a lighter weight yarn. It looks beautiful. It looks more like the one that's in the book on the cover. Um, but, you know, 
this is what I had, this is what I was going to use. I don't, um, that once I've done this, I could see myself making another one more like Gillian's, more like the one that's in the book. Uh, maybe for like in our bedroom or in the spare bedroom. I'm at a point where I really want to add more handmade touches into our home again. But I want them to be, it's going to sound quite snobby, I want them to be high-end handmade. I don't want to have like crafted stuff in our home that doesn't suit our home. Our house is a 200-year-old farmhouse and it's beautiful. I've spent 11 years doing it up. That's I have painting leggings on now because after I've pressed stop on this podcast... I'm going out to paint um to paint the skirting boards in the kitchen. Like it's an it's a never ending process. We look after our house and it's beautiful. And so I only really want to put beautiful handcrafted items into the house as well. This fits in with that. So what I'll do is when I've finished it in the next podcast that I record, I will show you how it looks in situ rather than just showing you the cushion. I'll show you how it looks actually on our sofas, which are a dark charcoal grey linen. And so I just, I think the contrast of the mustard to the dark grey linen will just be superb. Love it. So that's only en route that I have. But um, I thought what I would do is share with you a couple of the next projects that I've got my eyes on. So the next one is Claudia's Encanto Wrap, as in Crochet Luna. I've been meaning to do this for ages. Claudia was an absolute honey and gave it to me when she um, brought it out. It was her first ever design. Yeah. And um, I've been meaning to do it, but I want to do it in lace weight. Only because... I've got a load of lace weight to be used up and I think if I hold it double I'll get a really lovely lightweight fabric and I can use up some of my light my lace weight and I can use it in something that I really want to pour a lot of love in. So I've I've worked out that I don't really really hate lace weight. I just really much prefer doing it on a bigger hook. I really don't mind um holding it double either and I love the final effect of lace weight it is so light and airy that you just don't have that bulk around you but you have the warmth for my money um depending on what it is that you're making you can sacrifice bulk for the same amount of warmth if you use lace weight particularly if you use wool I think so um that's number one that I want to make and the second is let me just check the name of it it's the Textures T V2 version 2 by Tiger's Eye Handmade. This came out, it was just like two days too late for me to start um, for before we started the podcast last month. It was a contender between that and Zigzag Zoomer and the Textures T just, ha- it was going to be out two days after I'd started the podcast I think. So that went back into the list and the Zigzag Zoomer got done. The texture tea is now out. It's size inclusive. It's really nice. It looks like it would be easy for me to adapt it to my body shape and fit, which I know isn't everybody's cup of tea. For many of you, you think, well, I buy a pattern. It should be able to work for me and for my body shape. That's just not the case for me. I like to be able to make things a bit more fitted and I expect to play around with patterns to be able to get the effect that I want. And I think I'll be able to do that with the textured tee as well. And that's another summer top. So I'm going to have a little stash dive in some more of my Rowan uh, stash that I got. Again, it's the stuff that I got from John Lewis for a pound a ball. So I'm I'm just trying to work through all of that stuff, basically. It's all in here in my office and I'm trying to clear space so that I can move that up into my stash palace and get more space in my office and studio because I am bursting at the seams with stock and I need more space because I keep on buying more stock because <laughs> you lot are lovely and you keep on buying stock so I'm just trying to make this more office space and less um, like the personal stuff and get some nice delineation between home 
about 10 metres that way and office and work in here in the studio. So, they're my two next things I'm going to work. I'm sure there are so many other things that um, if I thought about it, I would add to that project list. Really want to do a colour work crocheted sweater. I want to do one of Sandra's um, colour work things like, I think it's the Taroko maybe, but I would do it in very muted colours. Or one of her other colour work tops. I really like the idea of doing that, but that doesn't feel like something that I should be doing during the summer. I'd rather work on um, summer tops and try and get some use of them um, like in the next couple of months. And then I'll start one of Sandra's colour work tops. Um, I've added links for the Encanto wrap and for the texture tea into the show notes. None of them are links to Ravelry. In all of these show notes, there are, to my knowledge, no links to Ravelry. So um, feel free that when you click, it will not be to Ravelry. Um, so if you suffer from photosensitivity, migraine, seizures headaches you shouldn't be getting that click through if in the future anything does click through to Ravelry the um any links that I put in the show notes it says link in brackets and that's where you double click if it's going to take you through to Ravelry because I haven't found the designers if they don't have an Etsy shop or a blog or some other means of selling then I will put link to Ravelry so you will know that that's where it's going that's as of today Obviously, I haven't gone back through all of the rest of the show notes to be able to do that for everything else. That is something that I will probably look to do in the coming month, though, so that I know that from all of my 56 sets of show notes um, that I'm not taking you to a, prob a problematic site that might cause you um, harm, physical harm. Um, but that is a task and a half in itself, so... That's going to take me a bit of time. Right. We're on to feeding the habit. I've been so good this month, mainly because my uh, John Arbin order hasn't arrived yet. It's coming in a few weeks with the another Friday night colourway that I pulled together. Thank you. I know loads of you went and bought that and I, I hope you've got your orders already. And I really hope you like it. I am so proud of that colour. I cannot wait to get my hands on the squish and to be able to make something from it. And um, yeah, I'm really excited. I'm, uh, yeah, because I've not actually seen it up close. I've only done it over photos and colour coordinated that way. So it's the first time I will have actually touched a yarn colour that I created. Oh. <laughs> um. So I haven't actually bought any yarn. However, I have still had incoming in the form of goodies from Lady Di Yarns via Claudia. So she sent me a load of new um, pin badges. Just so you're aware, because I know lots of you collect Claudia's pin badges and um, rather than getting them from America, you come to my shop for them. I have loads of new ones for you. It's just going to be probably next week at the earliest before I get them loaded up. So uh, look out for some new ones in there. There are some amazing ones coming. Um, so in with that, because Claudia was sending me badges, she also sent me a Lady Die Badass Crochet bag and a Lady Die Badass Crochet um, long sleeve t-shirt as well. Oh my word, you should feel this t-shirt. It is so soft and the printing on it is so crisp and such good quality. Same with the bags. They are just amazing. So, again, I haven't worn them. I haven't worn the t-shirt because I wanted to keep it pristine for the podcast. But this is going on tomorrow. <laughs> this is tomorrow's uh, outfit. So, uh, thank you, Claudia. It was a really nice surprise. I was expecting just badges. Quite often she sends me peanut brittle as well and she wasn't able to do that this time because of lockdown. She even put it in the note. She was like, it's the first time I haven't been able to send you chocolate. It's like, oh, there's no chocolate. But I have a t-shirt and a bag. I know which one uh, has got longevity. Now, 
although I haven't been buying wool, that doesn't mean to say that I have new wool. I am, um, I have had, oh sorry, the little robin chick is outside my window and he's all fluffy and floofy because he's still got some of his young bird feathers and he's just bobbing around and trying to hide from the rain. He's very sweet. He's also really quite tame. <sighs> Digress. Um, so I've had loads of undyed yarn in my stash for quite some time and I just, I like to have a stock of it there so when the fancy takes me to do some dyeing, whether that's acid dyeing or a natural dyeing, then I've got something there to go for and I can just have a go. What that also means is it allows me to react to whatever seasonal plants are available in my garden or when I'm out on a walk. So we've been doing quite a lot of work on the garden of late and I had quite a few, I've got a tiny, I mean tiny, it's maybe five metres squared, if that, patch up. Um, it's up high so it's above an old brick wall, not brick, stone. It's um, It's part of the original farm boundary so the wall is most likely about 200 years old. And it's got a load of soil that's in there and I'm not selling it. It's like a little kind of woodland dell. It's where I keep all the woodland um, plants, but it was getting a bit overrun with nettles. So I pulled out all of the nettles, but I didn't want to just compost them. I wanted to see if I could do something else with them first. So I used them as a natural dye and I was expecting to get a soft grey blue not too dissimilar from the cotton that I put around the stone. Um, that's not what I got. So things to note with natural dyeing. What you think you're going to get or it's not necessarily what you're going to get. And as somebody commented on Instagram, the colour of the thing doesn't dictate the colour that you're going to get at the end of it. So if something is red, that doesn't mean to say it's going to come out red as a dye stuff. Like it won't colour your wool red. So, although I was expecting a soft grey blue, what I actually got was a very light green. So I didn't use a mordant for this. A mordant is your fixer, basically, that attaches the dye stock to whatever it is that you're dyeing. In this case, this is mohair. It's quite special mohair, actually. It's not kid mohair. There's... um. A woman who lives, I think she's over Nottingham Way, and she has goats. And um, quite often what you get is kid mohair, but her goats are older. And she put a call out to see if anybody was interested in um, whether the the um, fibre would spin up nicely enough. And Beck, my friend, said yes and asked me if I wanted some. So we went in together and got a kilo between us. So we each had 500 grams and I was intrigued to see what non-kid mohair would be like and it's delightful, it's really lovely. Um, it's got that sheen that you would expect from um, mohair. It's soft but it's still fibrous, like you know it's there, I can take it, some of you might not be able to. You know, you softer than soft folk would not want this. But I really like it. So the, the nettle came out as a light green, it was a bit insipid, I didn't really like it, even though I'd left it in there for days, really tried to let the dye do its thing, didn't get the blue that I was after, and then quite often what you can do is add a modifier for natural dyeing. There are all sorts of things that you can use as a modifier, I tend to use iron sulphate as a modifier because it um, saddens the colours and because I like things to be on the earthy darker side with a greyish tone that iron works really well for me and that's exactly what I did with my mohair. So it now has, it's a really difficult colour to try and describe to you. I've added photos into the show notes because on face value, it looks grey. It looks like a mid-grey, but it's not actually. It's green. <laughs> but it's a very grey-green. And with the sheen on it as well, it's just it's just beautiful. And 
It's one of my colours, it's a colour that I can take, it's a colour that looks good with my skin tone and I have 500 grams of it. And what I'm particularly proud of is, I don't think it's particularly easy to, um, to dye or jump a quantity of yarn um, unless you're a professional dyer and I don't think it's particularly easy to do it with natural dyeing either. And I have got five consistent 100 gram skeins of naturally dyed yarn. And I'm really proud of that. Like I took my time. This took, this is probably from picking the nettles to having dried, skeined up yarn. This is probably about a 10 day process. It's not quick because you are um, letting the leaves relax in a solution, in a water solution. You've got to... Um, well, I prefer to leave my wool in for 24 hours to soak so that it's nice and wet. Like It's a long birthing process to get naturally dyed yarns. It's very intensive, which is one of the reasons if you're looking to buy naturally dyed yarns, they are usually more expensive because they're a more labour intensive process, especially if the dyer is also going out to forage for the goods like Helen at Nellie and Eve does. So they're not buying in powdered natural dye stocks. They're actually foraging, processing, dealing with all of those things. But I'm really proud of this colour. Like I say, it's not the blue I was looking for. But I do love the colour. And if you are watching, I think that is a true representation that I've got up on the screen now of the green grey that it is. I, c I can't even think of anything in nature that it is replicating. Like the, probably the closest, it does have a bluish tinge to it, is, you know when you get the darker bit of the underside of a spruce tree, and it's not quite grey, it's not quite silver, it's not quite blue and it's not quite green. It's like that, but slightly darker. Some of you will be like, I don't know what on earth you're talking about. Others of you will go, bingo, I know exactly the colour you're talking about. That's what this colour is for me. More on the green than the blue side. Really pleased. So now I need to find a project that I can find that will do it justice. The twist on the shorn is also really lovely. Um, it's it's a really lovely even twist on it. So it needs to be the right thing because I feel you know I've got multiple touch points on this skein, and it's a very UK based. You know it's UK grown, UK spun. The nettles from, from my garden, I've done the dyeing. It need, it really needs to be something very special. Not content with that, I also dyed up another batch that I had in my um, stash palace. Was a 50-50 merino silk mix. I really like this yarn. I've used it a few times. It's one that Helen at the Wool Kitchen often has in stock. It's quite a plump yarn. What you get with the silk is that beautiful luster and drape with it. So I know this works up really nicely. And besides pulling up nettles, I was also pulling up dock. And so I had a load of um, dock leaves. And I had a load of dock root that I'd pulled up as well. Traditionally, dock should give you a mustardy yellow colour. No, I got green. <laughs> Everything is just green, coming out green at the moment. Um, I was really expecting mustard. I did not get mustard. That's the nature of natural dyeing. You just don't quite know what you're going to get because your water pH, there are so many things that affect it. Um, this one I actually did mordant. The mohair I didn't mordant because you don't need to do that with nettles. This one I mordanted overnight with alum for... Um, Animal fibres, not acetate, which is what you would use for um, non-animal fibres. So I used alum for this. And again, same process as this. I was doing the same, the two dyes at the same time. Didn't get mustard, got green. And again, I used um, an iron modifier on this because it was quite a light, insipid green colour. And I didn't want that. So the lighter green colour was done with um with leaves and an iron modifier and then I have a darker green colour which I only had the the ratio of leaves to root 
is much greater. So I could dye four skeins with the amount of leaves that I had, but only one skein, 100 grams, with the root that I had. And so it's a bit darker. That was a bit more concentrated. And again, I used an iron modifier on it. And if I hold the two up, and these are in the show notes, you can see that there's ever such a subtle difference between the two of them. And so what I'm thinking is I will... Um, do some swatching with these and see if the difference between the two of them in colour work is obvious enough. If it's not, then there's no point in going to the lengths of doing a colour work project with them because the two will just mould into one. Um, the lighter green is slightly... Well, they're both actually slightly more semi-solid. So, you know, when I say something's tonal, you've either got a solid colour which is pretty much where my mohair is at, that's a solid. And with the silk merino mix, it's tonal. So you get slight colour shifts within it. It's not solid. It's some of the terminology that um, dyers use because it's really hard to get a solid colour. Like it's quite an intense process. And if you say that something is semi-tonal, tonal, semi-solid, then the expectation is that it isn't just one depth of colour. So I've got little light patches and slightly darker patches within the silk merino. And I think that in part is down to the fact that this is a blended yarn because it is silk and merino. And the two um, bases will take up dye at a different rate. One of them might be more hungry than the other. And therefore you get this slightly different um, take up rate in the yarn. And that reflects in the final skein that you'll get. So, whilst I haven't been shopping, I do actually have a kilo of new to me yarn that I need to do something with. I also went up into my stash palace and discovered I think I might have, I don't think I'm underestimating this, maybe 15 jumper quantities of yarn up there from various places. Like some of them cost me a pound a ball, some of it is hand dyed stuff that I've got. Some of it is high-end stuff. There's a real mix within that. However, it's time to get it used up. I am I'm transitioning my wardrobe into a handmade wardrobe. But again, talking to what I was saying earlier about the high-end handmade side of things in our house, that's what I want for my wardrobe as well. I want it to look really beautiful. I want it to look quality not strewn together I want it to look really beautiful like I don't I would love to be like going somewhere and somebody says oh your top is beautiful and to be able to go thank you I made it like that's that's what I'm aiming for I'd better get cracking with that then here we are on to a quick news beats Number one is the July Global Hookup. That is going to be on Saturday the 25th of July at 8pm British Summertime, which is GMT plus one. And Sunday the 26th at 9am BST, which is GMT plus one. So details are all in the show notes. They are also up on Ravelry. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but they're in the show notes and I also put it up as a story um, usually I'm trying to do that now when the podcast goes live and then I add it in as a highlight in stories so there's a global hookups highlight you should always see the latest um, set of dates in there so if you get stuck and you don't know what the code is that's where to go to that's your quickest route for finding out um, when we're meeting and um, what time and what the access code is right number two actually feel slightly guilty telling you this bit but it's required I'm going to take a podcast holiday in August I have never taken a, po a holiday from the podcast before for the last four and a bit of years first Friday of every month boom a podcast has been there give or take YouTube farting about and causing me issues a couple of times but by and large come 10 o'clock you have got podcast content to go and consume um, the reality of the situation is I am knackered <laughs> I'm absolutely shattered we've just been working flat out throughout the lockdown um, 
things haven't slowed up, things have accelerated and uh, yeah, it's just, I need a break. Also, the viewing and listener numbers take a dip in the summer because you're all off out doing fun things, as you should be. You shouldn't be watching me indoors or whatever you're doing. So, you know, you should be off having fun doing things. Um, and therefore, it feels like a good natural time to actually have a month off. The other reason for doing it is I don't feel like I'm bringing you my best work at the moment. Um, and... I, f- I feel like I can be doing better now. I also recognise, and I'm sure some of you will be shouting at the screen and you'll be shouting in your cars, I know that I put a lot of time and effort into the podcast and I know I research the backside out of things and I know to many of you, you possibly won't understand what it is I'm saying because you'll think the content is normal. But my gut feeling is that I'm not hitting the beats that I expect to hit with the podcast and um, you know that I'm very business-like that I've got certain things that I want to achieve and the podcast is part of that and I don't feel like I'm hitting those beats and I want to you know I don't stand up here to be frivolous and to just chat I'm here to learn things and I'm here to pass that knowledge in and if I don't feel like I'm hitting that then something needs to give and I think a pod holiday is the best way to do that. What that doesn't mean to say is that I'm going to disappear. Please do not fear, I will be back in September. I absolutely love doing the podcast, but I just need a break from it for a month. I need to just recharge my batteries, work on a load of Podman as well and get certain bits and pieces up and running and make a few changes and just have that breathing space to be able to do those things to come back in September like busting it that's what I really want I want to come back full of energy having had a month out and um not that I'm not excited about the podcast I always am but I want to be like over the top brimming with enthusiasm and I don't feel like I'm there at the moment so month off in August I'll still be about on Instagram I'll still be about on another network that I will tell you about hence episode being called social network so um, and of course there's the hookup in July but there won't be a hookup in August so when I say pod holiday I mean no podcast no hookup uh, right number three let's talk Ravelry <laughs> um, I'm sure you're aware of the utter debacle that has been Ravelry and the lack of support I feel that they have given to people that suffer from headaches migraines photosensitivity People have been having seizures. This is something that needs to be taken really seriously. Um, Kind of been issues with Ravelry for a long time. And I feel not necessarily supporting the right people in the right way, but being able to do it when it suits them and it suits their agenda. And on a personal note, I really hated the forum structure and the way that it worked which is why I haven't really been engaging in there probably for the last two years, which is unacceptable. It's part of our community. It's part of the podcast community. It's where a lot of the Crochet Clan gathers. Um, but I just never want to go in there because I find it really clunky and horrible to use. I don't find it intuitive. It doesn't light me up. And so I, it's like when I go in there, I'm like, oh, I've got to go into the Ravelry Forum. It's a chore rather than something that I want to go and do and it shouldn't be like that it's about our crochet clan it's about community it's about network and I don't get that sense from going to Ravelry so um regardless of whether or not Ravelry frankly get their crap together and I don't see it I just I don't see it happening anytime soon and it's almost well, it's not almost, it is, it's just, a, it's too late now for me um, because of the way that they've handled it or not. And also because Ravelry just doesn't work for me as a forum and I'm not the only one within the Crochet Clan that feels that way. And I know for some of you that you really don't mind the Ravelry forums and that you will be sad to see the Crochet Clan network and part of it come away from Ravelry. And I'm really sorry about that, but it's... 
I, I know that I personally can do a better job away from Ravelry and I know that I can personally support more members, more of our network, more of our community by stepping away from Ravelry. And also, it's the right thing to do. Like My gut is telling me stepping away from Ravelry is the right thing to do. So, I've been working away this week. This is why it is... Oh, it's 12 o'clock now on Thursday and I'm only just recording. That is because I've spent the vast majority of my week looking at alternative platforms that we can use as a home for the Crochet Clan. Not everybody is on Instagram. Instagram is also quite transient and the algorithms are such a pain in the backside that you miss stuff from some of your favourite people unless you're actively going and searching for them. They can You can miss a lot of content. So I'm looking for a home for the clan that feels a little bit more like Instagram but without the algorithms where we can add um, website links, where we can add photos, where we can add videos but also where it's a more private space. I thought I'd found it in a, in an app called Flock but actually for a few reasons it's pointless me going into that is not going to be our new home. And yesterday we started trialling. When I say we, what I mean is um, there's a kind of core group of Crochet Clan members that are helping me test this out to find a viable option. We were testing out Flock. That didn't work. The one that we're testing out at the moment is called Mighty Networks. And I think we found our home. It's an amazing space. It's available on... Um, mobile apps so tablets and phone and it links up to whatever you do on a computer or a mac and um, it seems like a very usable space it's very intuitive i've already popped into there under the topics bar um, as you would have had in ravelry different threads so there's a finished objects thread there's a whips thread there's a thread in there for clan gatherings so if somebody's going to go to a yarn show you could put the information in there and tell people where you're going to be and create a meetup for other people. Um, there's a cows thread in there, so you can add any cows that you're learning of, and we can get that side of things up and running again. There's all sorts in there. There's also a general chatter thread where you can just talk to the different members and just say hello and be part of that really special community. So, like I say, I apologise. If you really enjoyed that function in RAV, I'm going to leave all of the threads open. Um, I'm going to leave all of the threads there, but I'm going to lock them down because I just think that Mighty Networks is going to take over. Um, what we are on Mighty Networks is called Crochet Clan. I have added a link into the show notes and you can click on that link and then I will be able to approve you. I think you can also find us just by searching in Mighty Networks. If you put in Mighty Networks and um, Crochet Clan, you'd find me and you'd be able to um, request an invite from there as well. We're going to keep on testing Mighty Networks for a few weeks. And then if I think it's going to do everything that I want it to do and it's not creating people issues, and let me be clear, there's no point in me moving from one platform that is creating accessibility issues to another one that's going to create issues. If that is the case, then Mighty Networks is not the place for us. So one thing to be aware of at the moment is it doesn't seem to have dark mode, but I'm putting in a request for that. Um, it just means I would need to find yet another platform. But I honestly think Mighty Networks is it. I've done some digging. I can't find any information online about people having issues using the Mighty Networks site at all. And if I type that same Google search in for Ravelry, it's pages of um, information with people suffering and having issues with the site. So we'll keep on testing for a few weeks. And then my plan is if you want to come in and help us be part of that test bed, then fantastic. Lovely. Thank you. Please do. There is already we set it up yesterday morning. There's already so much information in those threads. Like it warms my heart. I am so convinced that hopefully it, as long as we're not causing people physical harm I'm so convinced that we found our new home that the clan has a forum home and a community hub and I'm really excited about it like 
I can look on my phone like it's an Instagram app and I can react with you all and I just wasn't doing that in Ravelry and I know that some of the um, kind of core crochet clan weren't doing that on Ravelry either and it's a place where you can ask questions and we can share and I just I love it and I want to go into my computer and I want to see what everybody's up to so it's like yeah it, it feels like the crochet clan has got the potential to really move on and up and have a proper proper network it's very exciting um so come and join that if you don't want to join that because it's we're still kind of beta testing it then when I come back in September I will be letting you know exactly where we've got on with that and what I'm hoping is that I will have by then set up I mean I will have done by then I will have set up a set of lead questions so you don't just get automatically added in the people that I've added in now are people that I know. I know their email addresses, I know who they are. They aren't randoms that are trying to infiltrate a network. So I will ask very specific questions um, in there and once you've answered those questions then you will be able to get access into um, the Crochet Clan. But that, that will be coming probably in August time. Very, very excited about this. It's like having Instagram without an algorithm. I really like it. And feedback from the people that are in there is that they're really enjoying it as well. So if there are any other podcasters that are watching, um, I am very happy to maybe have a training session with you. Um, maybe we could do a joint one whereby um, I can show you how I did all the setup. I'm on the free pricing for it, so it doesn't have to cost you anything, but equally you can move up to paid pricing if you wanted to do more you can do subscriptions from there you can do teaching accounts from there it's got so much potential within mighty networks um so if you're in the space that i was in at the beginning of the week please 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 do not um like don't do all of the research that we've done don't double up on that. Just come and talk to me about it and I will tell you why we're using Mighty Networks and why I'm not using all of the others because I've literally gone through maybe 20 different sites over the last few days to find a proper home for us. Like, I've really researched this. Um, so please don't put that effort in. Just come and talk to me about Mighty, Net or Net Mighty Networks and I'll give you as much information as I can. Right, that was number three. Oh, there's more. Uh, oh, just to add with that, if you go into Mighty Networks, you can either feed back to me there directly in there. You can private message people or you can email me. My address is in the show notes and um, let me know what you thought of it. There's no point in me creating a network that you don't want to use. Um, so, yeah, get, pass me some feedback and let me know what you think. Um, kind of following on from that is that my patterns are still on Ravelry. I had already migrated them all to Etsy at the beginning of the year because I was unhappy with some of the stuff that Ravelry were doing and the non-supportive, more the stuff that they weren't doing and the lack of support for certain things. And I don't mean at all the Trump stuff, like all power to them for that. I was fully in support of that. Um, but I mean, that they, in my mind, they weren't properly supporting um, other people within their community. So I'd already moved all of my patterns over to Etsy. To be honest, I'm probably going to pull away from Etsy and pop them onto Folksy, but they are also on my website so if you don't want to use Ravelry but you want to peruse all of the patterns that I've got the link is in the show notes and it just takes you to all of my patterns so I've given you a collection link rather than the home page you don't have to do much to go and see what I've got there so um, and you get PDF so it's not that different from being on Ravelry other than you don't have a library to be able to access your stuff from right oh Sorry, one more thing. Um, you will find that many, many designers are stepping away from Ravelry. It's a bold decision. It's a difficult decision to make. And if you can't find your favourite designers on Ravelry, lots of them have moved to a site called Payhip. 
So if you just type in the name of your favourite designer and pay hip, P-A-Y-H-I-P, there's quite a high chance that they have moved over to there. And it's basically like a, a front sales page. It gives them their own page of a website where they can sell their patterns from. It's specifically there for electronic goods. Um, so that's one to look for. I know a lot of designers have moved to pay hip, pardon me, and away from Ravelry. So things are going to be in a state of flux for the next few weeks. Um, but that's one way of finding your designers. Big up. Um, this one can only go out to the core of people that are helping me beta test the um who did flock and are helping me beta test my to network and for anybody else that comes in to try and create a really great forum. Thank you, thank you. There's no point in me sitting there in isolation thinking, oh, this is going to be good enough. Like having the feedback, seeing people interact, getting feedback from people on this works, this doesn't is really invaluable and it's allowing me to create a much better um network space for the crochet clan. So I'm going to name you all because you all know who you are. Massive hug. Thank you so much. I really think we've got something special going here. Right. That's me. I am done. Um, I will be back on the 4th of September. My stomach is churning with this, by the way, just so you're aware. <laughs> like, I don't feel easy about the fact that I am taking a podcast holiday because I like to be able to deliver. However... <laughs> I just need to and I'm going to do it and I know none of the rest of you will care you'll be very supportive but my stomach is churning with the idea of having a month off I think it's in part because I am so deadline driven and one of the reasons I've delivered a podcast month and month out is because I have a deadline if I didn't have that deadline I would just let it slip and I would be like oh, I'll do it tomorrow I'll do it tomorrow so I just need to refocus my brain that my next deadline happens to be on the 4th of September, not in August. Right, that's it, I've done it. I've like, I've cleared that in my head, I'm done. My next deadline is the 4th of September. I will see you then. Have an amazing summer. If you're Northern Hemisphere, if you're Southern, enjoy crocheting with those heavier weight wools and yarns. See you soon. Bye-bye. As ever, thank you for being part of this podcast, your involvement and being part of the Crochet Clan means an awful lot. If you've enjoyed what you've seen and you want to support the podcast, I have a ko account and you can find that simply by searching for the Crochet Circle podcast or you can find links in the show notes. Thank you. Sorry, and slurp some tea, that was a really big slurp. Did you get that?